Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the episodes that I do. Today, we have on Brenton Langle. As you can see on the screen, he's in two places. He's in the browser and he's live. Uh, if you're not familiar with Brenton, he is, uh, among other things, a comic book artist who has recently been working on an illustrated version of Darudi's life. Mm-hmm. Uh, Though I got, I got to stop you there. I'm not, I'm not the artist. I'm the, I'm the writer and creator. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And you have several artists, correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, I, I, there's an anarchist, um, uh, theater and, uh, arts, uh, company that I started called autonomous collective, uh, after the Monty Python joke. And, uh, that's sort of my label. Um, I also work with publishers like scout comics. Um, and yeah, at the moment I'm working on one of the biggest and most exciting projects that I'm working on is Darudi shadow of the people, which is a, uh, biopic slash war epic about the life and death of, uh, anarchist point of Ventura Darudi, who is, uh, one of the greatest people to ever live and one of my personal heroes. And then, yeah, you do a couple other ones too. I, uh, I know I've heard a lot about Snow White Zombie Hunter. Snow White Zombie Apocalypse. Apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, I have the copy of issue one. Oh, yeah, right here. Um, yeah, so this is, if it can be seen. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Snow White Zombie Apocalypse. That uh, started out... So I kind of came to comic book writing uh, and creating in a a very roundabout sort of way. Um, I started out uh, as a, as a, you know, very young child thinking I was going to be an illustrator and just really grew up with it with a huge love of comics, uh, particularly uh, Calvin and Hobbes and ElfQuest uh, by Wendy and Richard Penny. Like those were two of like the really the titles that really spoke to me. And uh, for the longest time, I thought I was going to be like a newspaper cartoonist. Um, (laughs) And then I realized that, yeah, there's no money whatsoever in that. Um, So I said to myself, well, okay, I will be super practical and become an actor. (laughs) So uh, I I trained as an act, uh, classically trained as an actor, Uh, I have a degree in theater from the university of Kentucky. And um, by the end of you know, I worked as a professional actor for like two years in and around the Midwest, um, learned a lot, you know, like college, mostly by accident. Um, but, uh, eventually, um, after I, I sort of had a personal crisis, uh, a very dear friend of mine, um, passed away in his sleep at the age of 25. And mm-hmm. I had just turned 25, like five days before. (laughs) So, um, yeah, it, it really threw me for a loop and, uh, I wound up, uh, you know, what do you do after that? You go do a musical? No. Um, (laughs) so my, my, uh, my employers gave me a sabbatical, um, and, uh, I wound up leaving and, uh, hiking the Appalachian trail, Maine to Georgia. Uh, when I got back, said to myself, okay, not afraid of anything anymore. Time to go to New York. Oh shit. I don't have any money. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you kind of need that there, I hear. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I worked, uh, I got an apartment uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, across the street from a, a, a slaughterhouse, actually, um, oh. which was brutal. <laughs> Very yeah. surprised I'm not a vegan after that experience. Um, and, uh, yeah, just started uh, doing theater, doing art, trying to get everything out that I could. And um, when it came time to move to New York, um, I got set up with a job working uh, in fundraising at Carnegie Hall. Um, for another company. And um, uh, I uh, started like, uh, as soon as I got to the city, I just, for some reason was just like, no, I'm, I'm done acting. I'm done screwing around. I got to do the thing that I'm really good at, which is writing and storytelling. So I became a playwright, was the playwright in residence, still am for a company called State of Play Productions. I've had uh, seven New York City productions of my work, uh, which is the one I'm probably best known for is uh, North to Maine, um, which is the first play ever about the Appalachian Trail, uh, sponsored by the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. Um, And uh, that's followed by uh, Snow White Zombie Apocalypse, which began as a short 10 minute play in the Estro Genius Festival, a celebration of female voices, um, which has been in New York for years. It was a wonderful festival. And, um, you know, when I wrote that first script, it kind of 
lightning struck, everything came together and uh, people have really liked it. And I find that, you know, since then uh, it's interesting that I use the figure of the zombie because that story just won't die. <laughs> it keeps rising again. And so in some new forms, it was in the, the, I did a longer version called snow white zombie apocalypse. It's in the fringe festival in uh, 2012. Um, got offered an off Broadway run, but it would have been personally financed. And if I, it, it, by me, and if I had actually dropped that kind of money, um, my Swaza would have opened, um, right when hurricane Sandy hit New York. So <laughs> I dodged a bullet there. Um, yeah. And from there, uh, I made some contacts in the comic book industry and I'd always been really interested in comics. I had my own web comic series in college. Uh, I actually created a comic book called Ninja Roommate that I got carried at a couple of stores, um, in and around Lexington, Kentucky. I think there may still be like, if you go to a plus comics, you may still be able to find like the one copy in the back if the guy hasn't thrown it out yet. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. And so I just, I, the, the the play so it's basically like the comic came out of the play and the, the whole thing just sort of came full circle with me getting back to my roots uh in comics and cartooning um but this time as a writer as opposed to a writer illustrator well i have my own uh, uh comic book uh experience from not too long ago i used to have a nickname taken from the johnny the homicidal maniac comic books if you're familiar with those and, mm -hmm. you know i see uh, the crux shadows mentioned on your site so i <laughs> There's some uh, bona fide goth points there. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, yeah. Crew Shadows is an incredible band. Uh, Rogue. Um, he and I are collaborating on a uh, fantasy uh, novel set in the afterlife that begins when the main character dies. Um, hopefully that novel will be out soon i can tell you the process is really really slow but the work we're getting is really good so uh, you know that's really exciting yeah that's awesome uh, i look forward to that one uh so i simultaneously found out about you as a comic book creator and uh as a anarchist debater on <laughs> uh modern day debate and other shows as well when how did you wind up getting into that because it's such a different mindset Oh yeah. Well, I, sort of in uh, 2011, I, I started identifying as an anarchist probably 2010 to 2011 ish. Um, I had moved to New York, you know, um, interestingly enough. So back in college, uh, I was actually a right libertarian. And before that I was uh, like in high school, I was like right on track to be like young GOP. Um, and I was, arguing on the internet about, uh, politics and stuff. Um, and, uh, that was something that I'd always really enjoyed. So when I went to college, um, that was around the time that the Bush administration, um, blocked, uh, gay marriage. And I was really mad about that. Uh, I didn't hate gay people and I didn't see any reason why, uh, they should be denied the right to get married. And between that and the disaster that was the Iraq war, I was just like, okay, screw it. I'm going to be a, uh, a right libertarian. Um, or at that time, all I knew was libertarian. And so, yeah, I was kind of, um, very much like a right libertarian guy, probably not super radical for libertarians. Like I was never anywhere near an ANCAP. Um, but I, you know, I thought the free market was the best way to do things. Um, and I think a lot of that was just honestly like privilege and kind of isolation. I didn't realize how bad people had it in the real world. Like I'd been raised fairly well to do. And, um, I just sort of thought that was how everybody was. Um, and then also like, as soon as I got out of college, uh, I began, you know, working as a professional actor, making below the poverty line, um, seeing people get exploited, uh, both at like acting gigs and also just, you know, at, at normal standard jobs. And I just programming broke down. It flipped. Um, it's almost like. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever watched uh, the show Gilmore Girls, but like, there's no, a, I have a friend who loves it though. Yeah, my wife loves it, which is, w w which is why I did. I think the dialogue is phenomenal. Um, but like, uh, there's a character called Paris who's kind of like a type triple a personality. And there's one episode where she gets hired as a, um, 
like as a caterer for this event and it's like her first time like working like a real job and she like instantly becomes a marxist <laughs> um it was it was kind of like that for me like you know you 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 get in out of the real world you work some real jobs uh particularly ones that don't pay well because the arts doesn't pay well um and uh you kind of get to realize just how messed up our society is so you know i started identifying as a democrat um around that time um i did not vote for obama the first time but i would have um and uh then uh, what really happened, you know, when my friend died and I walked the Appalachian Trail, uh, Maine to Georgia, I spent six months living in the woods and the thru-hiker community is very anarchistic in how it functions. Um, you know, you carry everything that you own on your back. You brag about how little you have. Like we would compete to see who had the least and was still able to do what we were doing. And the whole community, uh, you know, 20 miles out in the woods, there, there's no police, there's no law, um, but the whole community takes care of each other. And the entire thing is based on random acts of kindness from strangers and uh, the use of public and common property. Um, in fact, it's interesting because Benton Mackay, um, who uh, created the Appalachian Trail, uh, you know, he, he was a socialist. And the idea was to have a place that workers could go uh, for uh, fellowship uh, with the wilderness. So the experience of hiking the Appalachian Trail and living like that really just, it got me thinking. And then the, the immediate contrast between that my short period of job, my uh, jobs in Louisville, and then moving to New York City and living in Manhattan, um, specifically in Harlem, um, seeing the class politics. Uh, and because I'm running in artistic circles, I'm mixing with everybody, you know, proletarian artists, uh, people, you know, in my neighborhood. Uh, and then like, you know, I'm going to big time like arts fundraisers with millionaires. So I sort of kind of, I, I gained an intuitive class consciousness through that. Um, around the same time, I had been arguing on the internet with some anarchists because I found out that they were anarchists and as a red-blooded American male, absolutely not. This must be terrible. I had argued with them for a while and uh, realized that anarchism was not what I thought it was, um, that I would have to learn about what it was to win the argument. So I went I read a bunch of books. I learned about it, came back, won the argument. And then about six months later, I was like, ah, shit, they were right the whole time. <laughs> and that was when Occupy Wall Street happened. So, you know, not to get all David Copperfield on you, but, um, you know, I dismissed Occupy at first because um, there were lots of socialist marches in the cities. Uh, and um, then I started to, like, see my friends there. And then I started to, like, see my friends getting arrested and I'm just like, oh, something really big is happening. I have to get down there. Um, and I painted a big black and red sign with white letters that said, um, class warfare, bring it. <laughs> and uh, went down there thinking I would be the most radical person there. I, I expected like champagne socialists and Democrats. Um, but what I got was an honest to God anarchist movement. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Living in New York City, being a part of Occupy, that got me really interested in continuing to argue about politics and to make my case for a better, uh, saner world. Um, I became one of the last yippies, the Youth International Party. Um, we used to run a mic uh, called the People's Soapbox out of uh, the Yippie Museum before it was uh, repossessed by the rich people who now own it um, and turned into a boxing gym. Um, and, uh, yeah, like, I mean, I went from, you know, learning hands-on kind of media training, you know, I, I wound up getting arrested at the six month anniversary of Occupy, um, started, I had a radio show for a while. I covered the Cecily McMillan trial. She was the only occupier to be charged like with serious charges and wound up, um, you know, going to, she was in Rikers for, um, uh, several months, um, I actually was the only journalist who managed to go in and interview her in Rikers, which was nuts. Um, and uh, yeah, it sort of continued um, until like around 2014, 
Occupy had kind of totally died down and um, something had happened that kind of shook me and, and made me kind of feel that Occupy was actually dead. Um, and so I kind of went uh, onto the internet and uh, got back into my old sort of reply guy um, uh, ways. And then that led to um, me Inv involving myself in a major fight between anarcho-capitalists uh, that are fake anarchists, they're not anarchists, <laughs> they think they are, um, and like actual anarchists, because I'd been reading Orwell, I'd been learning about Derudi, and you know, these people are like, oh, anarchy is about making money and serving your boss <laughs> and, the, and respecting the private property rights of others. And I'm just like, what? You were like Christian rock, come to life. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Uh, yep. Yeah, and I think that's what we were talking about beforehand uh, about sort of what the topic is here. And I don't want to, you know, spend too much time stumping, but you know, essentially uh, the suppression of Occupy Wall Street, um, seeing how the police actually function, getting arrested, spending you know uh, several uh, hours in lockdown, um, not knowing exactly what they were going to do to me uh, if they would let me out, if I would lose my job having to deal with the court system afterwards. Um, uh, we won, by the way. <laughs> and, um, you know, like, all of these things kind of uh, connected to sort of form a perfect storm where I wound up being very active in a number of radical anarchist Facebook groups uh, where ANCAPs and libertarians would come in and argue and, you know, we'd yell at them, they'd yell at us. Um, and that eventually led uh, to me somehow getting hooked up with James to do modern day debate. Um, and, uh, you know, he, after I'd done a few debates, he recognized I was a strong debater and, you know, he's had me on quite a lot. I was most recently doing one on um, Roe v. Wade. Um, and so that's sort of been like the other kind of part of my, my brand at this point is, you know, I'm the guy that will go in and argue with usually far right weirdos. <laughs> um, yeah. Which I think that's pretty important. Uh, uh, let me take you back real quick to what you were saying about Occupy. First of all, just to mm -hmm. clarify, you're, you are talking about New York when you say that, right? Mm -hmm. Occupy Wall Street. Yeah. Yeah. Which, when, yeah. So... Yeah. My experience in Phoenix is, was very different at first when Occupy happened in New York. Even though I was an anarchist, I also thought there was little hope for it until I saw winter come mm -hmm. and uh, the encampments last through that. And then I was like, OK, this isn't a joke. <laughs> yeah, and, that's amazing, uh, uh, actually, because I remember um, Bloomberg. Um, a lot of people thought he like the winter was going to force uh, us out because New York winter is is brutal at times. Right. Um, but then you know when he realized that wasn't going to get rid of us, that was when he sent his freaking stormtroopers in there to bust skulls and intimidate journalists and you know drag my friends out of their beds and throw them in jail. Um, <laughs> yeah, the and uh, the interesting situation of finding out Zuccotti Park was not public. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It used yeah, to be Liberty was, Square. Yeah, that was a very interesting time. A lot of people became radicalized through that movement. What what's interesting about your story is that, you know, uh if all of this began <laughs> when you were in your mid twenties, uh it would seem really quick, but you were politicized to begin with, it sounds like at a pretty young age. Uh, yeah, yeah. A lot I mean, of people don't even think about politics when they're that young to begin with. So, when I was in the fourth grade, um, I wrote a, um, I, you know, if I had written this story today, I probably would have been pulled out of school um, for it. But I wrote a, we were supposed to write a mystery. And so I wrote a fictionalized mystery about Hillary Clinton killing Bill Clinton. <laughs> And she was like the, 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 and Garfield. Oh yeah, that was it. Garfield was the detective. Garfield, the cat. <laughs> you know, I actually in fourth grade had to write a mystery and I got in a lot of trouble for writing a murder mystery. Uh, oh. <laughs> so, See, there you go. <laughs> yeah. That, that could have been you. <laughs> yeah, it, it could have been. So, I mean, 
Yeah, I, I mean, I was political from a young age. Um, I started out being pretty conservative because my my dad is a Republican, uh, voted Republican his entire life, uh, but has very strong like working class values. He was ready to vote for Bernie uh, in 2016 before uh, Hillary uh, squeezed him out, and um, luckily he did not get sucked into Trump. Uh, at, at, well, he did, but he came out of that before, like right before 2020. Um, and, uh, <laughs> he voted libertarian, <laughs> which I was yeah. fine with at that point. I was just like, as long as it's not Trump. <laughs> um, yeah, that's always an interesting situation. They're from Illinois. You said, uh, Illinois. No, no. Or, um, yeah. Uh, so I'm a military brat. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, my dad uh, is, used to be he's, – he's a doctor now, but he used to be – he was a flight surgeon in the U.S. Navy. Uh, I was born in Italy, actually, um, and then raised in first Catania, Sicily, then uh, Pennsylvania, moved from Pennsylvania to Virginia, Virginia to Kentucky, Kentucky uh, to Ohio, Ohio to Kentucky again, hiked the Appalachian Trail, and then moved to New York City. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right. Not, not a lot of pins on the map. Yeah, exactly. But I'd say primarily, you know, my family, a lot of people in there were based out of Pennsylvania. So that state probably had, and he's from Pennsylvania. He went to Penn State. You know, like that, that the state of Pennsylvania kind of is sort of, if you have to pick one home, even though I haven't lived there, that that's sort of where my family is from regionally. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, let's start getting into the topic. Um, you said a little bit earlier, you know, we both dislike the anarcho-capitalists to say the least. Uh, I think, I don't remember what I was doing a video on, but I asked you to review it and, uh, I, I, oh, I think it was uh, the one where I was responding to Richard Wolf mm -hmm. and I had mentioned something about Rothbard and you had some very interesting things to point out to me about, uh, Rothbard's history. Yeah. Uh, Murray Rothbard, I can't even hate him totally. He is the father of so many of my ulcers <laughs> over the years. But um, so Murray Rothbard um, is somebody who kind of uh, originally got into politics um, in New York uh, by involving himself with like the Randians, like Ayn Rand, the objectivists. Um he was at least smart enough, uh, and I actually really respect him for this, uh, he did not get pulled in. Um, and he immediately recognized how authoritarian Ayn Rand actually was. Um, and uh, that eventually like led to um, him moving in a different direction. Now, there is an essay, I don't know if I sent it to you or not. If I if I didn't, you should look this up. It's called uh, Radicals, Imbeciles, and, and FBI Stooges. Uh, we've hit rock bottom, baby. That's like the whole title. Um, I found it because, as I mentioned, I'm like one of the last yippies. Um, and it was an examination of the FBI's influence uh, through the uh, right libertarian party um, specifically with the goal of destroying 60s radicals. Um, and this tied also directly into um, Charles Koch. Uh, so, yeah, I, did, did I send this to you? Uh, or are you just hearing about it now? No, yeah, you you sent me something else that was some uh, about, it was something Rothbard wrote. I think it was a brief magazine article, but yeah. not, not that one. Yeah, that's the one. So Rothbard, he said, he honestly, I will say this, like as a professional writer, Rothbard's a pretty good writer. Uh, his prose is the best thing about him. Um, though that's about this kind of damnation with faint praise. Um, yeah. So basically one of the big problems in the sixties was that young, uh, middle-class and below, uh, white people were getting radicalized. Um, because of one, you know, capitalism is objectively a garbage system. Uh, the United States government for all its, uh, pretenses of anti-authoritarianism, uh, and, um, a commitment to liberty is anything but, and you only have to see like how both parties 
function when they get into power, especially like what just happened with uh, Roe v. Wade getting overturned. And now, you know, Mitch McConnell is running around trying to make it illegal to even leave a state to go to another state where abortion is legal and have one. Like he wants to put people in jail for that. Um, and th- it'll, those laws will probably wind up getting passed and we'll see, you know, how it, it, not to get off on that tear, though, but, you know, the American government just isn't what it says it is. Um, you know, right. America as a nation is not what we were re- were raised to believe it to be. Um, and uh, that when the yippies, which, you know, was started. Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, um, uh, Hoffman famously wrote Steal This Book. Uh, there's famously this, the trial of the Chicago 7 uh, when right. they went to protest the Democratic National Convention. And um, they, they were charged with crossing st- state lines to incite a riot because uh, they wanted to put up as their candidate uh, an actual pig <laughs> that they had named Pegasus the Immortal. Um, and you know, the, they, you couldn't have that. So the country kind of tried to crack down on them as reds. Uh, they failed because Abby Hoffman was not an authoritarian like Marxist. Uh, this was much more libertarian socialist kind of direction. Um, and so when they had failed to destroy the yippie movement, using the might of the state uh, and sort of the uh, power of McCarthyism that had cracked and broken um, and failed against people like Abby. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is, this is a theory. It's not totally provable. um, So I'm not, I I don't want to tell you guys that, you know, the way I'm connecting the dots here is 100% true, but I think it's, it's feasible. Um, The, uh, the FBI was looking for another way to silence um, uh, radical socialists among the American youth. So if you, if you read this article and it's got the, there's receipts there, it's got um, uh, the various flyers and letters and stuff that were sent. Um, This guy discovered while going through a trove of um, uh, I guess uh former media stuff uh, on the yippies, he found this um, pamphlet. And the pamphlet uh, came from the Hunter College Libertarians. And it had a picture of Richard Nixon on the front with with a gun to his head. And with the, the only dope worth shooting is Richard Nixon. Like, that's what the flyer said. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what was interesting was, was, of course, someone who found this flyer um, the, and the flyer was like calling on yippies to attend this conference, um, sent that flyer and reported it and sent it to the FBI. And the FBI says, we don't care. We, we There's no information. We don't want to look into the Hunter College libertarians. Um, and that right there is really suspicious because this was the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover. Okay. Yeah, I mean they're they're incredibly paranoid. They're looking into everything. So somebody actually sends out a a, a pamphlet threatening to kill the president, and they don't care about it. So what wound up happening with regard to that uh, is that around the same time there were two major people in the Yippie Party. It was Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin. Uh, Jerry Rubin famously um, kind of grew in a less radical direction. He became rich. Um, He suggested that what people needed was more capitalism um, and was really kind of like, he was the precursor to libertarians who are Republicans that want to smoke weed, you know? Yep. Um, And I think what may have happened here and is that the FBI, uh, perhaps other things within the the United States government, but also specific oil interests like Charles Koch um, and several other oil billionaires, um, realized that um, in order to combat this type of um, anti-authoritarian radical thought that was turning Americans against capitalism and against their way of running things, um, 
they sort of created a kind of controlled opposition. Um, and they took sort of the dumbest parts of what uh, Jerry Rubin was talking about, where which is like, just do it, just be selfish, do whatever you want, you know, that kind of thing. And that became the foundation of the American Libertarian Party. Um, like SEK3, I don't know if you're familiar with him, Samuel Edward Cronkin. Uh, he is uh, the guy who created um, agorism. Uh, okay. Which, yeah. I've heard of that. Uh, I don't know how old it is or its history or anything. Yeah. A lot of it comes from SEK3. There may be some other currents of thought in it. Uh, I, I hold a lot of agorists in contempt. Uh, because it seems to me to be an ideology, um, you know, an ideology entirely built around uh, ducking out on your taxes and selling drugs on the Internet. <laughs> yeah, I, the, right. So uh, long story short, they're uh, anarcho-capitalists, but believe in black markets as and gray markets as mm -hmm. the uh, the only way to really get to the anarcho-capitalist Utopia. ideal i guess yeah so uh, you know and i know I, I swear this is coming to an end here i i, I apologize for being so long-winded oh no uh, i'm gonna back you up even more so don't worry <laughs> oh good <laughs> um yeah but so what wound up happening is is that like sek3 um samuel edward cronkin the third um, famously uh, took this other guy, I forget his name when he was a youth and like gave him his like political awakening. And one of the things about this was taking the kid to um, like the Hunter College Libertarian Alliance. And I forget this particular individual's name, but he grew up to be a far right uh, influencer, essentially. Um, and so it, it seems to me, um, based upon the, we had motive, we had opportunity, we had means. We don't have proof, but we between that issue with the Hunter College Libertarians and the FBI combined with a professor by the name of Richard Fink getting um, Charles Koch to start funding his right libertarian project, um, you we wound up having essentially what I would call you know controlled opposition to uh, the radicals, a, a recuperated form of libertarianism that took out all of the radical things about anarchism and presented instead a, uh, you know, a cleaned up um, sort of, uh, oh, it was a way that a young person who was rebellious could feel rebellious without actually doing anything rebellious. You know, it, it was the, the, the style of anarchism, not anarchism itself. Um, yeah. So yeah. let me, so I, before we move forward on that, let's go a little further back. I don't know how much you've looked into this, but I, when I was just looking around for, um, content for this episode specifically, I came across the foundation for economic education, mm -hmm. which has a YouTube channel. And if you were to, I'll pull it up on the screen, but if you look at their YouTube channel, it's like the slickest, most hip, uh, that's what oil money gets you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this uh, organization began immediately after World War II. And uh, along with the Koch brothers and um, uh, a bunch of other indus industrial leaders and corporate owners and everything, you know, in 1946, they began funding free market think tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, and they opposed the Marshall Plan, Social Security, minimum wage, and all this other stuff before the Libertarian Party was even formed. So uh, I think that adds to what you're saying, because uh, after World War II, you know, labor was fairly crushed, uh, not all the way, but a lot by that point. And... Uh, you know, I'm sure there is a lot of collaboration between some parts of the government uh, and the Foundation for Economic Education, which really launched financially and uh, on an organizational basis, the the future of what would become this libertarian anarcho-capitalist clusterfuck that we have. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so like... 
I'm glad that you bring that up too. And I didn't even know that it went that far back to tell you the truth. So good, good job on your research, but to, to bring this back to Rothbard um, and to kind of put this on. So what happened was, was that um, when I was in my phase post occupy wall street, um, I, the anarcho capitalists tried to steal a Facebook page called anarchist memes, um, which was oh, really big at this. the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I w I was furious. Um, like I had been sitting, just, you know, put yourself in my shoes there. Um, I had discover, I had read homage to Catalonia. I'd been a part of Occupy Wall Street. I'd seen real anarchists organizing in the streets. Um, you know, and, uh, what I wound up doing was like, and I'm reading about, the suppression of the anarchist movement uh, in Spain. Um, I'm reading about all of these amazing people who gave their lives to promote human freedom, uh, Buenaventura de Rudy being one of them. Um, and to have to run into an ANCAP, and not just to run into them, but to watch them uh, exploit Facebook algorithms to get a page unpublished and then immediately create their own fake page that is that looks just like the, the intent was clearly to defraud people and make them think that they were signing back up for the anarchist memes page when really what they were doing was signing up for a new one completely controlled by anarcho-capitalists. Um, so, you know, uh, I wound up working with some other people on Facebook, um, uh, particularly with the page, um, still laughing at anarcho-capitalism, uh, that helped get, I, I dedicated an episode of my radio show, uh, Insurrection with Brenton Lengel, uh, which was on the radio at that time. It was before I, uh, put it into, uh, uh I guess, uh, suspended animation. <laughs> I, um, and I know that page. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It, it was, it was, it's a great page. Honestly, uh, I wish, uh, Facebook algorithms would, would show it to me more often. So I remember, but, you know, so I started working with that, um, became very active in the group. And that's really when I became aware of, um, this group of people who called themselves anarchists who were most assuredly not, and had you know, these are people who the father of anarchism as a political movement is Pierre Joseph Proudhon, whose most famous quote is property is theft. And the funny thing is, is, you know, he famously um, quarreled with uh, a, another person in France, uh, sort of in, in this, and, and it was a guy by the name of, uh, Fr I think, Friedrich Bastiat. Bastiat oh, was, yeah. A, yeah, classical liberal. And you, you look at the, uh, you look at like, actual ANCAP thought, they're not pulling from Proudhon, they're siding with Bastiat, and they're a continuation of Bastiat's tradition, not the anarchist tradition. Um, there's this thing that happens, um, and uh, you guys can look this up, it's called recuperation. Uh, recuperation is the process by which a society um, devours, digests, and spits back out uh, radicalism. Um, it approaches a radical thing, whatever. Great example, actually, would be rock and roll music. And what what do you see happen? The Christian rock, the, like Christian churches and stuff, put forth all of these bands that sound like the rebellious bands that kids are listening to, but all the songs are about Jesus. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I don't have a problem with Jesus, like not the version of Jesus that those people have, but, but the yeah. point is, is that like, you know, it's when people try to make a cab, uh, you know, ACAB, um, into all cats are beautiful or always carry a Bible. Um, it's like when urban outfitters, uh, used the Che Guevara image um, to try to sell like an upscale Che Guevara t-shirts. Um, luckily they got slapped down by uh, the actual creator of that image um, who I think I, is, yeah. Fun fact. Um, I was on an episode of HuffPost live about that. And during it, he, he said occupiers could use Che Guevara's image however we wanted. That's <laughs> funny. Yeah. He's a great guy. Um, huh. I, th I think he, he, he may have by now changed the copyright over to Che's family. Yeah, that's a nice thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know. There's, I don't know if recuperation fits the ancient form of it, but 
clearly religions also would take the gods from one and transform them into their own gods and things like that. Very yeah. similar sort of power move. Exactly. Because if, if you can control the la- the language by which people express themselves um, and the symbols by which um, ideas are expressed, you can effectively destroy an idea. You know, you can't kill an idea with bullets. Um, you know, you can't imprison an idea, but you can muddy the water so much that the, the actual truth of the idea is completely lost. And instead, uh, the symbol means something else. Great example, of course, would be, you know, the swastika, which, you know, uh, uses an ilio by Buddhists for centuries. It's, uh, also was a, like a pagan symbol and, you know, it was and as an as a star. Yeah. And what did the Nazis do? It, they did the same thing they did with the the OK symbol, and the same thing they did with Pepe because they're stupid and they don't. And they only have one tactic: um, is to take someone else's symbol and recuperate it and turn it into something that it's not. Um, so this is my thought on Rothbard, and the reason why I think Rothbard was doing this and doing it knowingly is there is there is an essay that he wrote um, called. Uh, called Are Libertarians Anarchists? It's a very good essay. You can find it like on like, it was on lourockwell.org for a while. It's still up online. Usually the right libertarians um, host it and like really try to couch it in a million things. Like they point out that it was never officially published, but that's just because Rothbard couldn't get anyone to publish it, not because he didn't believe in what he said. Yeah, it, that's, he, like, that's like saying to a Marxist that like the the gotha program whatever <laughs> yeah. it doesn't count <laughs> yeah critique of the gotha program doesn't count because uh, yeah and marx didn't actually believe any of that stuff so uh, what rothbard wound up doing um in the articles he breaks it down and he talks about anarchist history he he is very knowledgeable about the broad strokes of the anarchist movement he knows of, he, he doesn't have the best feet on it but he knows about the anarcho-communists uh, slash uh, you know uh, libertarian socialists um, that's the tradition that I identify most with, uh, the Kaprotkinite tradition, um, you know, uh, Bakunin, another big one, um, Rudolf Rocker, um, anarcho, anarcho communism and syndicalism, uh, being like the largest and most successful schools of anarchist thought growing out of the more radical currents of the French revolution. <laughs> Rothbard knows this. And he says, he's like, okay, so these anarchists, which are most of the anarchists in the world, um, they're definitely nothing like right-wing libertarians. So, you know, let's, um, you know, let, let's take a look at the, uh, at the individualist anarchists. And he's looking at, you know, Lysander Spooner, Benjamin Tucker. And he's like, well, these guys uh, have a, gr-, you know, because these are essentially market anarchists and mutualists, you know, he's like, well, these guys are kind of like what we like, but no, they're, they're still too socialist. Right. Um, yeah. For us. Cause you know, the, the freaking, also, um, American, they're American, which is also important. Yeah. Uh, in that, but yeah, go on. Yeah. Well, it, not only are they American, but like Lysander Spooner, um, Lysander Spooner, um, he is really celebrated in sort of the voluntarist uh, communities. They don't know that he was literally a card carrying member of the first international, (laughs) the IWA. Like this man is a socialist through and through. Um, But he, because of the type of socialist that he was, um, a lot of them feel, take a lot of ideas and inspiration from him. Uh, For instance, like, you know, neo Confederates will hold Lysander Spooner up and be like, "Look, look, he wrote no treason," and I'm just like, "You guys clearly have not read Spooner because well, Spooner it's was." It's like what? what they did with Proudhon in France. Uh, yeah. A bunch of right wingers created the Proudhon Circle and mm-hmm. totally screwed that up for a while. Yeah, well, why did they keep doing this shit? Um, <laughs> so um, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I got a little thrown off there, but. Well, so they're influenced by the American individualists uh, Mm -hmm. and uh, tried to build themselves up on top of that tradition as Mm -hmm. if it was compatible. Perfect. Yeah, that is exactly what I meant to say. Thank you for, uh, you know, getting in there and rescuing my stupid brain (laughs) (laughs) when it gets file not found. Um, 
Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, Rothbard continues um, after talking about the the anarcho communists uh, slash syndicalists and um, the uh, American individualists. Uh, he then uh, turns his gaze on the Tolstoyans, you know, the anarcho pacifists, um, and here in um, you know he again finds that. You know, I mean, it's Leo Tolstoy. He is like the most famous um, anarchist in history. He's one of the most brilliant writers in history. He's right up there with like freaking Shakespeare and um, uh, Shakespeare and Cervantes. So (sighs) Rothbard, again, finds that his ideology is not something that is compatible in any way with capitalism. And he says as much in the essay. Um, so he says, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, each of these three, uh, anarchist tendencies, um, and we, uh, uh, find them either to be, um, socialists or collectivists, um, and looking at the phrase anarchist and trying to go through etymology doesn't help because, you know, um, the what a word supposedly originates as doesn't have anything to do with how that word is used now. And so he ends with saying, you know, uh, therefore we must conclude that we are not anarchists and those that call us anarchists are not on fir- form, firm etymological ground uh, and are also being completely ahistorical. Thank you, Rothbard. You're 100% right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, so the foundation myth for uh, where anarcho-capitalism derives its uh, legitimacy is busted by the dude himself. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. And they, they try to get around it. Like they hosted it on Lou Rockwell. They host a version of it on uh, Lud- Ludwig von Mises uh, Institute. But like, <sighs> Even there, they're they're like couching it. They don't just give you the essay. They they explain to you that it was written under a pseudonym and it was never published because they want to act like this was not Rothbard's views. He didn't think it was good enough. No, just nobody cared enough to publish it because they hadn't realized, you know, that they could effectively steal, um, you know, from the libertarian left. And that's kind of a, a spoiler for going ahead uh, because there's another uh, book of Rothbard's um, called, um, I believe, um, The Betrayal of the American Right. Um, or also might be right-wing populism, uh, one or the other. You'll, you'll find it. Um, where he then goes on to, to say, in print, uh, after he has already concluded that right libertarians are not anarchists, he reflects on how great it was that the right had captured, used that word, captured the word libertarian. Because if you, outside of the United States, and really outside of the just the last few decades after Rothbard, no one meant what the American libertarians, you know, call themselves when they said the word libertarian. They meant anarchist, specifically like the creator of libertarianism the first person to ever use the term libertarian in the political sense is joseph de jacques uh who is a a fairly famous french anarcho-communist poet so libertarianism he used that to refer to his anarchism libertarians are communists (laughs) but you know uh the word libertarian sounds so good especially to americans um, especially to the, the sectors of America that, um, you know, kind of really see themselves as pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps um, and see, you know, they make like one of the big things within this stew that creates the libertarian movement with regard to Rothbard is like he also pulls along all of these um uh, neo-confederate morons like these people who are still fighting like the civil war there's an essay that he goes into you can find it where he talks he, he denounces uh lincoln and sherman uh, as murderers um and there's a case to be made for both of those and you know one would think that you would then go on to also denounce the confederacy but rothbard doesn't do that 
Rothbard specifically states that not only does he want their uh, statues torn down and their war songs tossed into the fire, he wants to build statues of Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis. So right. Yeah. And yeah, and there's so much racism in the history of the Libertarian Party, who in 1972 had to decide whether or not they would even call themselves that. They initially were thinking of calling themselves the New Liberty Party and then I decided really on Libertarian. <laughs> so, and that was in 72. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, not so clearly this is uh, a borrowed term We're talking mm -hmm. about like. Yeah, absolutely. 80 something is how long libertarian was a term with the Jacques or 1850 or who knows, some, something like that. Yeah. Well, and it's so kind of like um, I, I, I talked about recuperation yeah. earlier on. And, you know, I, I, I think the example that I used was, um, you know, Urban Outfitters selling Che Guevara T-shirts uh, to, to rich yuppies. Um, what is happening with uh and as i said you know rothbard used the term captured is is that the entire anarchist history um the the wealth of our uh philosophy and thought um are actively being overwritten and made to mean something else yeah um I, I mean, you can even see it like with, uh, you know, uh, the, the fact that a ton of like neo -conser or I'm sorry, not neoconservative, a ton of like neo-Confederate libertarians are out there and they're, they're posting pictures of uh, like um, uh, Lysander Spooner with like a yellow thing and his little peace symbol up. Guys, like Lysander Spooner wrote No Treason, but that he didn't want – he didn't believe that you could charge anyone with treason, but also he literally wanted people to go sneak into the South, free slaves, organize them into militias and turn their whips on their masters. So obviously this, you know, peace don't attack the South is not what Lysander Spooner was all about. Um, but his image and his legacy has been co-opted and recuperated and presented in a light where uh, people think that, you know, he's he's sitting there and in a way, you know, standing up against an overriding, uh, you know, authoritarian government trying to take the rightful property from its owners, in this case, slaves. Right. So, yeah. So... Let's I'm sorry, go. Oh, so we're talking a lot about the history. And mm -hmm. um, something I've noticed about ANCAPs and libertarians is that they're especially bad at history. I mean, like third or fourth grade bad at history. And yeah. I don't know if that's part of the praxeology or whatever you call it. Oh, we'll, we'll talk about praxeology. Uh, yeah. And actually, I sort of want to get into that because mm -hmm. um, uh, it's. I think it's interesting to understand what goes so terribly wrong in the libertarian mind. Uh, yeah. But, it's very important. And, and remember, guys, I was one of these people, like my entire college career, uh, four and a half years. Um, and I... It, oh, Cringing at old Brent. <laughs> yeah. Oh, on, <laughs> and Brent, also, I'm old Brent. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Previous Brent. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, the, you know, I feel that the, I can't prove this. I don't have uh, the statistics behind it, but I have a suspicion. I think with regards to the Tea Party, I think the Tea Party in a big way gave a lot of power and fire to this right libertarian movement, as did, you know, Ron Paul. Uh, Ron Paul uh, actually created the Von Mises Institute. Um, and um, if you guys, you know, uh, doubt, uh, um, <laughs> if, you, if you guys doubt like the, um, uh, just like how incredibly important, like, I guess, racism and the argument, like, you know, that the, the, the 
the pro-segregationalist argument using private property that you know this is my lunch counter and i can choose to serve whoever i want to this is my hotel's pool and i can choose who goes in it so you get to this weird point where it's like you know pour pouring acid on black swimmers not aggressive uh swimming in a hotel pool very aggressive (laughs) oh yeah and Oh, what did that right the the Ron Paul thing? Mm-hmm. I mean, if you were not politically conscious during the Ron Paul revolution, where the revolution, you know, love or something was emphasized in the word and what the E was flipped around or something yeah. like <laughs> like corn era ridiculous, <laughs> like um, it's hard to explain how big of an influence. Ron Paul had uh, because what exactly what you're saying when it comes to recuperation, he really created a controlled opposition during the Mm -hmm. presidential elections. And so many people around me uh, fell in love with the guy during that time period. Yeah. I I will echo Noam Chomsky where I say, you know, I've never met him, but I think Ron Paul's a nice guy. Like if I had to have dinner with one of these ghouls, um, you know, I'd be very happy to to have dinner with Ron Paul and talk about whatever. Um, but like, yeah, he was he was a huge he was a huge figure in this movement, and a lot of the right libertarian movement that people don't realize is it grew out of like the Barry Goldwater campaign. It was Trump before Trump. Uh, you know, uh, there is a strong, um, sense of like a strong undercurrent, shall I say, of, of racism and white nationalism, like in this movement. Um, the kid that I mentioned at the beginning of this, that Samuel Edgar Conkin, the third, um, like was taking to the Hunter college libertarian, like he grew up being someone who would argue for um, incredibly racist and white nationalist uh, politics. Uh, SEK3 himself was on the board. Uh, it's, it's still on their website. He's on the board of a notorious Holocaust denial publication, <laughs> you know, um, and th- all of these like exceptionally like crazy um, and, and um, I, I guess uh, radical far right reactionary tendencies um, are caught up in the liberty movement. And we, we can see this and it, it actually kills me because there are libertarians that I know who I like and I know don't believe this stuff. But like the Libertarian Party, for instance, just removed uh, we um, uh, condemn bigotry. Uh, from their uh, their platform, and now it's we we support civil rights civil rights for like all people. Which, by the way, guys, the reason they're doing that is so whenever anybody complains about something that like white nationalists are doing, they just say you're you're being a bigot against white people. Like it, oh. it's the, it's the it's okay to be white strategy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which so, uh, you know. <laughs> During the Ron Paul presidential race, I think the same people who would have so there's so much to cover in this. Um, it is a fascinating and weird deep dive, and please take advantage of my pain and don't do it yourself. <laughs> well, so I became politicized during the uh, public infatuation with Ralph Nader, mm-hmm. and I think that the same demographic who supported Ralph Nader is or became uh, Ron Paul's base. Yeah. And uh, I feel like it was the si- There is the part where it's an attack on people more radical than the green party. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really feel like the, uh, the stylistic aesthetic and whatever mm-hmm. aspects of um, Ralph Nader's approach was, totally copied by Ron Paul. Yeah, I I will agree. And, you know, the Ron Paul campaign, I think it came, it it gave, again, the disaster of the Iraq war, um, the obviously unpopular um, attempt to ban gay marriage. Um, Now the overturning of Roe v. Wade, the, what's happening again is that 
these movements, whether intentionally or not, they're serving as a sieve to keep people who are rightly disgusted with these things and don't want to be a Republican on the political right. Mm -hmm. Like th that's, that's the, the goal. And that's why you see so much money behind this movement. Um, you know, and honestly some very skeezy, like used car salesman tactics. Uh, oh, yeah. you mentioned Praxy. Like, are you familiar with like the Prax girl YouTube channel? No, actually, to be honest, just researching this, I heard about praxeology, <laughs> read a little bit about it, kind of got the gist, but no, what, what, tell, tell me what this is. Okay. So, so for those of you, for the uninitiated, praxeology is the method of the, um, Austrian school of economics, which is what informs the, 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 uh, right libertarians and especially like anarcho capitalists. Um, this grows out of, uh, the philosophy of, of quite a few people, but primarily for these types, uh, Ludwig von Mises, who I should mention, uh, praised fascism as the savior of Europe. Um, then also, now to be fair, if you read that quote, he will also say it only works as a temporary tactic. Um, not you know, and to do, see it as anything more uh, would be a fatal error. But then he went to work for an, the fascist Austrian government. <laughs> like, so, yeah, it's it, it, it's just these, a lot of these people. They're so principled, but they don't actually have any principles. <laughs> so, you know. Um, Dealing with like, if, if you guys doubt this uh, and you, you think that, you know, the, the right libertarians and the right libertarian party is, is not racist, uh, it does not have a strong fascistic element to it. What I would what I would invite you to do is to look out at find the racist Ron Paul letters and read those. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, one, for, for telling you to read those because you're going to be disgusted. Um, now, supposedly Ron Paul did not write that. Um, but clearly it's his magazine. He signed off on it or he's responsible by negligence. Uh, the, there's some speculation that the author was Jeffrey Tucker, um, not the individualist anarchist, Jeffrey Tucker, the, the Jeffrey Tucker guy who, um, you know, gets ecstatic over the love of capitalism because, you know, he gets to eat a cheese stick in the car. <laughs> right. <laughs> I wish I was making that up. <laughs> oh my God. There is a video where he's just like, capitalism is love itself. And, and he's literally, he's been at McDonald's and he's eating this like gross fried cheese stick. <laughs> oh. Oh. And you know what? Honestly, like oddly on like Jeffrey Tucker is one of the better ones. Like he actually confronted Richard Spencer when uh, they tried to, uh, bring the alt right directly into the libertarian uh, into the libertarian party. So at least he did that uh, and took a lot of guff from other uh, right libertarians for doing that. Um, and you know, about I think one third to fifty percent of the libertarian party got leached out into um, you know the out and out like white nationalism alt right mo movement where you got right. people see heiling Trump, uh, you know, to, for Richard Spencer. And yeah, Richard Spencer's not, uh, he, he, he claims to not be economically right, but you know, the, you got Christopher Cantwell, you know, the famous libertarian to white nationalist pipeline. Yep. Yeah. It, well, and even now they're still pulling that grift. Like one of the guys that I've debated a number of times is like actual fascist JF Garipe, uh, who, um, <sighs> literally funded by Jeffrey Epstein, oh <laughs> like $20,000. The reason JF has a career is $20,000 was given to him by Jeffrey Epstein to like start his YouTube channel. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And, I, but, I haven't heard of that one, but that guy, but yeah, well, I'm sorry again, because you can find, uh, I debated him, uh, on a couple of things, uh, like race and police violence. Um, uh, I debated him on, um, oh, him and Stephen Molyneux, Stephen Molyneux, another example. The they, crying they, Nazi. Yeah. Uh, well, no, no, Stephen Molyneux is the egg guy. Um, oh. the crying Nazi is Christopher Cantwell. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then there's that picture, uh, Nick Fuentes. 
Yeah. Nick Fuentes. Um, yeah. I don't know if Nick Fuentes ever claimed to be a libertarian. He probably did. Um, Augustus Sol Invictus, who is, is, is like Florida man when he's not it, Florida man, if he wasn't whimsical anymore, like <laughs> this is a guy um, I actually um, uh, <laughs> actually dragged him through the mud at a debate at one is, point. But yeah, is this is a, a guy like the Norse who, mythology guy. Uh, he's kind of, uh, so Augustus Sol Invictus is a lawyer from Florida. Um, and, uh, he was the libertarian candidate for, I believe it was state Senate in Florida. Um, and he was known for, uh, being an out and out fascist, um, declaring that if the uh, next American civil war did not happen, he would start it. Um, and, uh, <sighs> He also supposedly like went into the wilderness uh, and slaughtered a goat and drank its blood in like a in a uh, dark magic ritual. Um, so like, yeah, th this is this is the, the this is not everyone in the libertarian movement, but this is what the libertarian movement allows and what they um, uh, you know uh, will um, tolerate within their ranks um oh, this is yeah i haven't seen this guy before i was thinking of a different guy <laughs> uh, <laughs> going on. there's just so many like um yeah so uh, essentially to tie this in with um you know charles coke um and, and david coke as well um you know the coke brothers have really pushed um you know uh they, they have really pushed Austrian economics um, in, right. in, in a big way, um, which is the weirdest thing in the world because the only reason they're like rich is their their grandfather worked for Stalin. <laughs> uh, learned the oil trade in Stalinist uh, Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and so like – these you know these guys have more money than god they really don't like it when the government tells them no you actually can't give your workers cancer and leave them hanging on the line you know you you have to have some workplace safety regulations and so they you know freaked out and uh, proceeded to start all of these uh, economics programs within colleges specifically like for the purpose of indoctrinating people. Uh, the most famous one, of course, uh, being the one at George Mason university. Um, you know, the, 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 the whole purpose of this propaganda is to do, in my opinion, uh, two things. Uh, the first thing is to, uh, prevent leftist radicalism from rising, uh, in the American youth, like it did in the sixties. Uh, they do yeah. not want another uh, summer of love. They, they, they do not want another successful civil rights movement, uh, you know, uh, and part of the reason that they were able to be that successful, I'm not saying it was because the, they were leaders, but the hippies essentially uh, abandoned their uh, class loyalties um, you know, and sided with uh, people who were struggling for civil rights. Um, in fact, uh, actually, there was um, when I was arrested with Occupy Wall Street, I was being taken to one police plaza. And um, while I was being brought in, you know, I had my hands uh, zip tied behind my back. Um, my, my elbow was bleeding. Uh, I was still pretty high on endorphins because uh, a police officer had thrown me into a motorcycle. I saw this impossibly old uh, Catholic priest. Uh, coming out of the um, of the one police pl plaza, what when I was going in, um, he stooped. He was being helped along by by two other priests, and I found out um, that he was part of Occupy Faith. Uh, his name was Father Paul, and he had marched with Martin Luther King. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, so so he left. I went in, and he, he died shortly thereafter. It, um, but like. Leftist movements in general terrify the powers that be, and it's because we actually are a threat to the status quo. That is why there is almost no money on the left. 
Uh, you and I, are, there's no chance for you and I to become left wing influencers in the pay of oil uh, of like an oil baron or something. There's no right. left wing equivalent of that. Not getting any Soros checks. Yes. Um, what, well, I'm getting the Soros checks, but one, they're they're very very small, and you know I got to tell you, every time like for my Antifa super se- soldier serum, like he makes me freaking take a picture of my uh, receipt and then I have to print it out and fax it to him. It's the most annoying thing. I got like a pile of, of receipts here that I just haven't sent because I don't want to go through a fax like a freaking savage. You're lucky you don't have to magnify yours. I have to magnify mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was funny. Okay. So off of that, uh, you know. Um, well, let's bring it back to the praxeology thing. So, yeah. so at the heart of the the libertarian Austrian school uh, economic thought is this basically this idea that you have to make things about human action, hence the word praxis, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, somehow, their idea of human action doesn't include history, which makes it a lot <laughs> different from any other praxis oriented philosophy, Marxism, anarchism. Uh, existentialism, Mm -hmm. probably Immanuel Kant, (laughs) Hegel. Uh, (laughs) These are all people concerned with praxis, uh, but you get the libertarians somehow don't realize that history is important there. Yeah. Well, they also reject um, empirical um, data, like for economics. Um, This is really, actually, so if you go and check out, there's a, uh, a really great debate review um, where uh, I and uh, Ben Burgess review the debate between Austrian economist uh, Walter Block uh, and uh, Dave, Dr. David D. Friedman, uh, who is uh, the son of Milton Friedman. Um, you know, he's a Chica- He's in favor of the Chicago School of Economics. Who somehow and- we haven't mentioned yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I got to tell you, um, I so I debated him. Um, it was me and American Johnson versus him and um, uh, philosopher uh, Mike Humer. Um, though Mike spaced on the date and didn't show up. <laughs> the most right libertarian thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like he didn't show up until like two thirds in the debate and then proceeded to ask me if I was a murderer. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, they these love people, that. They yeah, love they, that. They love these weird hypotheticals. And the uh, okay, so I don't know if anybody's watching, I know there's been a lot to be said about like t- tankies uh, and uh, Nas balls, which are not a thing, <laughs> but like, like tankies will do this thing where they will, uh, what's it called? Um, they will virtue signal. And the way that they will virtue signal is they will say, I am willing to work towards revolution with this horrible person. And all the other tankies like look and they're like, wow, that guy's really into real politic because he's willing to work with so many awful people and everyone else just takes several steps back. The, <laughs> the right libertarians do the same thing, but not in it's, it's not with who they'll work with. It is what they will um, uh, what they will tolerate uh, in the name of, of, of liberty. So like, uh-huh. you know. Yeah, the 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 one that the meme that got made out of one of them uh, really like biting the bullet on this was like he he made he said that he would support rape town. <laughs> like, and I'm sorry to bring that in. Um, if, if somebody uh, you know, if you're worried, if trigger warning, I should have put that before that. If you want to skip this, just jump like you know 30 seconds into the future. But I just need to like there is a if you go to um, still laughing at anarcho capitalism, you find this meme. There is a quote from an actual like right wing libertarian anarcho capitalist who is saying that you know I may not agree with uh, you know with with the rules of rape town, <laughs> but I'm, I will like fight tooth and nail to allow rape town to exist. <laughs> Well, and I think they're also they're famous for uh, arguing that it's oh, what well, Robert Nozick argued. Mm-hmm. I think that it's permissible to sell oneself into slavery. Yes, right. Yeah. So, uh, 
I've encountered yeah. people who who've said that, like the, the, they've they've also de- declared that they are slaves to themselves voluntarily. Oh, it's so weird. <laughs> yeah, and Robert Nozick. Uh, I don't know how many people read him anymore, but in like American philosophy, analytical philosophy, he's. I'm pretty sure he's still taught as mm-hmm. one of the main analytical thinkers. And I remember when I first started getting into anarchism, going to used bookstores, here's the only fucking person I could find who had a book that had anything to do with anarchy. And of course, what was it? It was a libertarian book, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so like what I was getting at, um, and I think we, we, we got sidetracked a little bit, uh, probably my fault. Um, but essentially what this movement does is it, it does two things. Uh, the first thing is uh, the re- the recuperation aspect. Um, it prevents um, it, it prevents American youth from encountering anarchism. It prevents them from realizing what it is. So so they get raised to think anarchism is the Joker, or anarchism is all about obeying your boss and the and the private property rights of others and making money on the free market you know um like that's the first thing the the sort of to bring this right back to the beginning when i talked about the yippies uh, and that absolutely excellent um uh, expose um these are this is jerry rubin you know this is um the current of anti-authoritarianism that isn't for anything you know it, it's just me 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 um and it basically allows someone to feel like they are a radical without actually doing anything radical beyond i don't know buying drugs with bitcoin or whatever you know um so like that that's the first thing that it does the second thing that it does is it obscures the real history of anarchism effectively um, rendering the ideology to a certain extent. um, uh, Like unless you really go looking for it, you won't find it. You won't find uh, out about Buena Ventura de Rudy. You won't find out about uh, Emma Goldman in any kind of depth. You know, Um, you won't find out about Rudolf Rocker. You won't, um, you know, be reading about Proudhon and Bakunin, uh, Nestor Machno, uh, the, the, you know, revolutionary Catalonia, revolutionary Ukraine, um, and even, you know, the Zapatistas in Shypas right now and uh, the, uh, y- the PKK YPG in, uh, in Kurdistan. Like these groups, even, ex- even while two of them are still in existence and, you know, anarcho-communists, we've run whole cities and regions, um, you know, on an anarchist model and done it successfully. We have battled fascists like actual fascists with like real professional military backing and won. like this is an incredibly rich and incredibly powerful um movement towards actual human liberation and if you fall in and get sucked into you know uh the ancap chicanery you will either never encounter this or if you do encounter it you will reject it as commies um so and then like finally and this is kind of like a colliery on that one um what it does is it takes the right or it takes like the left libertarian libertarian socialist arguments against uh marxist communism and turns them towards the defense of capitalism so it, it basically it takes the 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 critique that we have of authoritarian socialism um you know uh and it just it it it, it gets rid of us steals our rhetoric and ideas and then also uses it to support capitalism which you know i'm sorry but from an anarchist standpoint capitalism is absolutely nothing but a uh you know a, a very elaborate um way of ripping off and enslaving the the majority of humanity you know, I mean, it's not chattel slavery, it's wage slavery, but, it, you know, it's slavery with extra steps. <laughs> yeah, they, and I don't know why, but libertarians don't seem to really understand 
what the critique of capitalism is because they think it has something to do with uh, getting rid of prices. You know, mm-hmm. they're always talking about the price uh, price signals being important because that was a big argument against planned economies, right? Yeah, USSR style planned economies, which anarchists don't support, <laughs> right? But they can't seem to wrap their head around what sucks so bad about the wages system and mm-hmm. why selling time is a, a not really a justified uh, metric of remuneration when you go to work for an enterprise, you know, and you're helping the entire enterprise, but you're only being paid in a metric of time. Mm-hmm. Why aren't you paid in a metric of how much that company is making instead? Yeah. Right. It doesn't, it's, it, 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 well, it's not, it, it's not even just that, like they will often, one of the arguments that they tend to circulate around, there's a really bad, very poorly made meme because a lot of these people just, oh my God, you see them try to create art and it is awful. <laughs> um, I, I hate to be catty like that, but Jesus Christ, if you see this meme, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's like a caveman. Um, and the caveman's like, oh, you know, I have to work uh, to get food or starve nature is oppressing me and they try to essentially argue that the capitalist and the wage system is natural and the fact that we have to work for capitalists under conditions that capitalists control uh you know essentially on pain of death by or severe impairment of quality of life by uh starvation exposure um or uh lack of uh, medicine um that that this is natural Guys, right. you have to, you know, to, to give a point to Marx, you, you have to acknowledge that labor is a part of humanity. Um, you know, Marx went as far as to say that to do labor is our species essence or gefeff or swicen or whatever. The <laughs> yeah. Thing is yeah. It's be yeah. part of the species being or whatever. Yeah. It, it, it's humans work. And the thing is, is that I understand this like intuitively as an artist, because, you know, there's a lot of different, uh, you know, career paths one can go down. Um, Mm -hmm. but like, you know, say you're a coal miner, if there's no coal to mine, you're not going to go set up your own tiny mine, uh, and like set up like snacks and drinks and, and, you know, try to entice your friends and family to come watch you mine coal. Um, the, but like artists, that's, that's what it is when you're a, uh, especially like when you're like a young playwright first in New York city with their first, uh, you know, productions, um, that kind of model is there. So there are so many people that create and labor in spite of capitalism while capitalism right. throws every single, um, like hurdle in their way to try to make sure that they, um, do, they wind up working for a capitalist doing whatever stupid crap that capitalist wants them to do. So that's like, yeah, that's their whole non-aggression principle, Mm -hmm. uh, like mental gymnastics they do to get around the whole exclusion of property everyone needs thing. Yeah. And then there's the other part of it, which is their, uh, we believe in an economics that's based on the consumer, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's what, what is that called? Supply side or demand side? Is it demand side economics? I, I think it's, or? no, so, supply. So uh, that wouldn't be centering the, the, the consumer. I'm, I'm actually not familiar with that particular slogan. Oh um, yeah. But Ooh, um, that's a supply side is a nice way of saying uh trickle down. Like, in fact, uh, I think somebody that worked for Ronald, it was either Ronald Reagan or George Bush senior was basically like, no, that's exactly what it is. Like supply side is trickle down. We just called it supply side. I, right. So the consumer, I think this has more to do with Austrian economics where they, they say, no, uh, capitalism is freedom because the people who are really in charge are the customers, right? Yeah. That's one of their big arguments. Like, that's what makes it so perfect is that here's this system where the market is supplying you, the customer, based on what you want. It's mm-hmm. so great. And they don't 
you know, this is in direct contradiction with their idea that they have an individualist philosophy mm-hmm. because a consumer is not an individual. Consumer is a collective of individuals. So it's a yeah. collectivist. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, a collectivist idea, idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, part of this, I think, is like, okay. So there's a certain way that humans tend to think about ourselves and others. Um, And, you know, this is just, I think, uh, because of how our minds work uh, as creatures and as individuals, you know, the, the consciousness is by necessity a, um, uh, a singular experience. It wouldn't be consciousness if it wasn't Um, at least not in any way that humans would understand. Um, So when you're sitting there and you're considering like what is an individualist philosophy, you naturally think of yourself as the beneficiary and the focus of it. But that's not what political individualism is. Political individualism is essentially the rule by elite individuals over all the other individuals that they group into a collective. So really what you're saying, you're not saying you are devoted to the liberty of each individual when you uh, extol this kind of right-wing individualism. What you're doing is you're saying that a few uh, elite individuals must have greater rights and must be able to thwart uh, and coerce uh, the vast majority of individuals. They just forget that everybody is as human as they are. <laughs> right. And then they'll quote some Nietzsche at you or something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Um, the, so, like, we asked about, and I think I got off this, but praxeology. Right. Uh, I, I did want to make sure to address this. Okay. Um, go. Yeah. Yeah. So praxeology and the way I first became aware of this is this horrendous YouTube channel named Prax Girl. Remember when I said these guys are kind of like, um, uh, you know, Lyle Langley style, like, um, you know, used car snake oil salesman. You know, and you really see it when you when you see like the way they try to sell you on anarcho capitalist and the ideology. Like, there's we we should do like a later episode where we just consume and talk about like ANCAP art because it is it it is truly a, a thing to behold. Um, but like so. The Prax Girl YouTube channel, where I first became aware of this, is a series of, of YouTube videos being put out uh, by a particularly attractive um, uh, performer. Because she's very clearly a performer. Like, read and I have this on the screen for the viewers right now. Oh, so. you do? They're seeing yeah. it? Yeah. In, you know, kind of a very tight, sometimes low-cut shirt, telling you about economics. Just... Just think about that for a second, guys. <laughs> like again, sex positive. You know, I, 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 I'm perfectly fine. However, a woman wants to show off her body, but this is not, this is not art. This is propaganda, um, and it's like not even good propaganda. It's very crude, but sadly, you know, lowest common denominator. Um, so, uh, praxeology is. If you've been arguing with tankies or Nazbols or whatever you want to call them, um, like they will say stuff oftentimes like, you know, you're not being dialectical. Um, and they right. have, yeah, dialectical materialism. Th- this is their pseudoscientific philosophical approach to analyzing history and society. Um, and I'm actually, so- I'm coming down a little harder on it than like I normally. I I think that there are some very salient things that one can learn from looking at history and social movements in this way, but it's, it's not scientific guys. It's philosophy. And, um, it is when you, it's when you call it scientific, you are engaging in pseudoscience. You're fooling yourself. Um, so (sighs) praxeology is the bargain basement version of Dimat. Like it's very much like a much more shoddily, poorly thought out 
uh, libertarian capitalist ver like answer, not necessarily version, but answer to um, uh, to Marxism. Um, I will compare it actually to like if you go and you read, and I, I don't necessarily recommend this, but if you decide you want to subject yourself to like uh, uh, Giovanni Gentile, I think is his name, uh, the the um, yeah. philosopher who worked for Mussolini. Right. You know? Inspired the fascists. Yeah. Uh, I mean, really, what seems to me to have happened there is like Mussolini sees Lenin and Lenin has Marx, his smart guy. And Mussolini is like, I need a smart guy. I need a guy who can give me the equivalent of Marxism. But also, he doesn't want to wait for <laughs> like for to to because you know Marx as a philosopher and intellectual, I, there's a lot of with him I disagree with. But again, like Tolstoy, he's up there, you know, with William Shakespeare, Cervantes in terms of uh, his influence on the culture. Um, so the fascism is in a lot of ways like the ideological basis. Because if you if you read Giovanni Gentile, it's it's gobbledygook. Like just absolutely unintelligible, like bargain basement, stupid crap. Right, he believes <laughs> in something called what pure idealism or something weird. Yes, like which is so dumb. Um, uh, yeah, that this is another thing. Um, so we, Marxists will always talk about how they are materialists, um, and so because Mar Marxists talk about they're being materialist and materialism fascists are like, we got to do the opposite of that. We got to have our, our smart guy. And he's, he, he believes that all of reality is actually in your mind, <laughs> you know? So Marx essentially, you know, with regard to, uh, you know, dialectical materialism, it's the idea that, um, you know, social movements uh, are informed and driven by their environment. Uh, by their class interests, by by the physical material circumstances. Ironically, you know, being a theater kid to bring this back, it's basically Stanislavski just like as a political philosophy, which would make sense. Stanislavski was a Russian, but like his whole thing is about like given circumstances. Um, you, when you try to learn to be an actor, you um, don't Act, like you don't try to play another character. You think about your circumstances and what circumstances in your life would get you to be this character. Um, you know, so yeah, it's very similar to, to Diamond. I wouldn't be surprised if Stanislavski was influenced by Marx. He probably was. Um, yeah. So, so fascists have their, you know, I forget what it called. Like, yeah like real idealism or, or, or some crap like that. Yeah. Um, they're smart guy though. And they yeah. got their smart guy. Yeah. And so of course, you know, the Austrians, they, the, the anarcho capitalists, they need their smart guy too. And their smart guy is Ludwig von Mises, which is why he's, you know, uh, was being uh, cheer led by Rothbard. Um, he wrote a book called human action uh, where he, you know, talks about defines praxeology Rothbard uh, you know also explains it I think Rothbard's definition is, is better than um, von Mises is but yeah it's basically like the uh, it, everything flows from their first axiom that humans act like people do things yeah no shit <laughs> like and because of this it sets off a line of logic that you know, we have to have capitalism. It's the best system. Money and markets are, you know, this is kind of their way of indoctrinating people. And, and I suspect that one of the things that happened, um, you know, obviously the Ron Paul campaign, there's this predates things, but when um, the economy melted down in 2008, I think there were a lot of people uh, who wanted to understand what was happening and why it was happening. Um, and a lot of these people had not been to college, you know, and I don't want to say that, you know, I had a hard time in college to tell you the truth. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. It's not for everybody and you are still valuable if you haven't. But like one of the things they teach you in college is like critical thinking and the ability to vet sources and realize, you know, is this person someone I should really be listening to? Um, and I really think that a lot of these people looking for answers got hoodwinked by this seemingly, um, you know, academic, 
um, uh, institution, the Ludwig von Mises Institute, that keeps putting out this propaganda. And, you know, they believe that they can use this propaganda to better understand uh, the economy and the world. Unfortunately, again, this is political propaganda. The, the, I, the goal of this is not to understand the, the economy. The goal is to uh, push for um, the kinds of policies that people like David Koch want, you know. Um, and people will bring up, by the way, that Koch and Rothbard feuded. They did. Like, Koch started funding him and then um they got in a fight and he wasn't funding them so uh you know ron paul went in and found and funded um uh rothbard and set up the uh ludwig von mises and this ties into as you said the foundation for what was it the free free I always uh, forget. foundation for economic education yeah yeah. which was directly involved also in like the initial like ron paul uh campaign so yeah, so th this is kind of the big sort of Ouroboros of crazy um, that uh, that is behind these intensely weird people. Um, there's also uh, an element, and this I find really, I don't know if this is on purpose, but I just find it really disgusting. Um, so you know, so you see the ANCAPs use their their gold and black flag, their copy of the um, you, you know the CNT5's flag, and other anarchist groups will use a similar flag. Um, right. You know, just Practically change the every, color. Every anarchist group has their own flag. <laughs> yeah, and to tell you the truth, you know, like the the ANCAPs are fine with that. Like you know, when it's really anarchists doing it, but what gets into my head actually is when you look at that because yellow is the color of liberalism it reminds me that you know around the turn of the century and before in the united states and also you know in europe there you can look this up there are a thing called yellow unions and this was a, a, a strategy that the bosses used to suppress unionization so essentially you would be forced to like if you were to work for an employer you'd be forced to join the union but it's not a real union and its uh -huh. purpose is to prevent strikes. Um, and in some cases, like in Spain with Derudi, like this escalated to murder. Like you, you would be forced to, to work for an employer. You would be forced to join this yellow union. Within this yellow union, um, there would be workers and there would be assassins pretending to be workers. Uh, this is, was called pistolarismoism. Holy um, shit. Yeah. And so what these guys would do is if they found you talking about unionizing, talking about mess, they would take you into the back alley and shoot you in the head. This, this is fact. This, you know, this was happening in Spain in the 1920s and thirties. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and, and, and probably other places in the world. So this gets very, very dark. And so when I see them taking the color yellow and using it as an appropriation of the CNT five flag, it, it, I'll tell you, it gets my blood pumping. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty chill these days about it. Cause I will say like, after all of the stuff that I've said, I have actually met some really good people who were slash sometimes are anarcho-capitalists. And me too, honestly. Yeah. Uh, so it, it is it is a difficult line to walk to like some of these people and to yeah. have such a repulsive reaction to the ideology. Yeah. Well, it's – so again, the purpose of this is to trick people who would become anarchists into becoming a fake anarchist-controlled opposition. Um, and so like, yeah, the uh, – the people that I met um, through the various Facebook groups, I used to um, run the ANCAP v. ANCOM debate group on Facebook, which uh, was shut down uh, after January 6th. There was another ANCAP v. ANCOM debate group that was started by an ANCAP that I banned because <laughs> they, they do the same thing. They try to trick people into thinking that they are anarchists. Um, and that one I have nothing to do with, and it's full of like fascist bots and weird people saying like, what if the child consents or some bull crap like Jeez. that? Oh, well, it's bad. <laughs> yeah. You know what I saw uh, trick a lot of people was this uh, idea of cronyism or crony mm -hmm. capitalism. 
being something different from real capitalism. Yeah. Which really does act as a way of blocking uh, uh, left critiques of capitalism for sure. Yeah. Well, it's again, you know, you mentioned these people don't acknowledge history, Mm -hmm. you know, exactly. Um, It, 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 and probably honestly aren't interested in it. It, it, so the crony capitalist argument is one that I actually encountered while I was at Occupy Wall Street. Uh, It's a intuitive idea that you can come to. No, the system isn't broken. What's broken is the the fact that they're empowering these cronies. Right. The way to get around this, guys, is, okay, imagine that you are a capitalist. And imagine you have the opportunity to buy yourself a mayor and rewrite the rules of your town um, in such a way that favors your business and, uh, you know, uh, ca- causes problems for your business rivals. Now, Will you stick to your libertarian principles and not do that and refrain from buying yourself a mayor or a senator or a president? Trick question, it doesn't matter. Because if you don't, if there is a capitalist who is, uh, you know, uh, principled enough to believe in real capitalism, not crony capitalism, guess what? That guy's going to get outcompeted and replaced by a smarter, less scrupulous capitalist. Right. This has happened in every society. That, like the, the capitalists, the state is always created to preserve property. And once the state is created, there are the levers of power. And if those levers of power exist, they will be seized. Uh, and, and once that happens, the people that seize them, the elites within society, will change the rules. And hey, everything's great for them and terrible for everyone else. And then real life example, totally relevant, the Koch brothers, dudes who are funding the libertarians, uh, guess what they helped get rid of? Citizens United. <laughs> Which, uh, there you go. If you want to complain about cronyism, there's your dudes. Yeah, right Citizens there. United. That was oh, that was a massive uh, loss. Uh, the, we actually got on um, the steps when we did Occupy DC um, back in 2012 December. Uh, might have been January, January, because yeah, in December the the NYPD I saw them arrest Santa Claus, <laughs> and uh, yeah, they they came in, they arrested like a, a priest uh, and Santa Claus. <laughs> um, like, uh, so it was, I think it was January 17th, J17. Um, there's a tweet I put out right around the time that got picked up by some media outlets. Um, we actually, yeah, like we got on the steps of Congress or, or not uh, Congress. The, um, we got on the steps of the Supreme court and chanted money is not speech. Nobody cared. Yeah. You know, that I was mean, a we big did part it. of Occupy get money out of politics. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was huge. Pretty broadly supported, uh, among a lot of the, attend- a lot of the different ideologies. Oh, yeah. I mean, Occupy was a very interesting kind of mixed bag. Um, I, I'm not going to name names here. The The, the reason that um, I when I when I finally was like all of these things tried to kill Occupy and they failed um, a fairly prominent um, uh, Occupy activist uh essentially went like dark enlightenment fascist and uh, sent this letter saying that Obama should make the CEO of Google, the the CEO of the United States. And I was just like, okay, you just killed it. Like you got the Peter Thiel, the Peter Thiel line going. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm sure they wanted their Ted talk, which they didn't get. Um, When Occupy was systematically destroyed, um, by police and mayors coordinating across the nation. Um, you know, uh, you know, and people like think back at it, like e- even now people on the left will be like, Oh, occupy. It got a little cold and you went home. It's like ins- guys, the left, the left narrative about occupy is insane. Like you're except you, they, the left broadly speaking has bought a myth of its own incompetence and it's, <laughs> It's insane. Like yeah. the state forcibly shut down Occupy all over the country. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and 
and your takeaway is that uh, the horizontalists or whatever w- couldn't figure out how to how to make decisions. So that's what happened. Yeah. Well, you didn't have any demands. Yes, we did. We had the direction. We had the declaration of the occupation of Zuccotti Park that was put out at the beginning. It was patterned after the Declaration of Independence, and it was like a seventeen-point uh, statement. And literally, that w- that came out immediately like just one month after occupy had really settled in and you know the 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 reporters were there saying what are your demands what do you want and you'd hand that to them and they'd say well what are your demands what do you want because right. they're just lying and trying to suppress the movement um not to yeah. mention all the working groups had clear demands <laughs> like <laughs> right i mean named after their demands mm-hmm. yeah so. absolutely so like all of that stuff was it, it, that was a horrifying thing but j- j- if anyone doubts this go back the the footage of the clearing of zakati park i believe is still online to like the nypd cam footage it, it's horrifying um michael bloomberg deployed the NYPD, I think it was something like 4,000 officers or something. Uh, I don't know if it was quite that big, but in that round, well, no, actually it probably was. Cause I think the police have a rule that they won't uh, interfere with like a protest group if they don't outnumber them three or four to one or something. Um, he deployed police helicopters to prevent news coverage from the air. Those reporters that could be counted on to co- to cover the attack um, you know, uh, truly uh, were intimidated and pushed away and not allowed into it. And Bloomberg called the head of the New York Times and got his personal assurance that no matter what, the New York Times would take Michael Bloomberg's side. Like, that's uh, what we're dealing with. I mean, uh, we all know how much of a shithole he is now, uh, mm-hmm. especially after running, a, you know, in the election. The other thing, you know, Black Lives Matter really exposed the New York Police Department no one it was really hard to make these arguments when occupy was happening uh Mm -hmm. people just didn't believe it they didn't believe bad things about bloomberg or the nypd yeah or Uh, capitalism (laughs) or capitalism even though you'd have like iraq uh you know war vets you know the war veteran occupiers making all their statements and just like standing up to the police in new york and Mm -hmm. just (laughs) It was it was an incredible time to be on the ground with that movement, um, and it, you know, Occupy. I think for a long time, you know, Bernie Sanders. I, I was just on Ben Burgess's program, um, and we were uh, critiquing the the first segment of Bernie Sanders versus um, Lindsey Graham's debate, um, and Bernie Sanders is he's using the one percent versus the ninety nine percent. That was oh. key. You know, yeah, I I really think without Occupy, the the Bernie Sanders 2016 campaign probably wouldn't have happened. I agree. Um, You know, the 2020. But to kind of like bring this all around to like anarchists and socialists, leftist radicals, uh, what needs to happen is uh, at this point where the Republicans have essentially gerrymandered the country to the point where – the amount, the, the level of popular victory in voting that we would need, like the percentage of votes that we would have to beat them in certain areas is obscene. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's, it's so small that, or I'm sorry, so large that like y- you can't even wrap your head around it. Um, they have been for years setting themselves up to rule as a minority party. The electorate is far to the left of the Republicans. It is far to the left of the Democrats. Yep. Um, and that that's the average American citizen. Like, you know, we talked about my dad being a, uh, being a conservative, you know, lifelong Republican voter. He was ready to vote for Bernie Sanders in 2016. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, um, these Americans overall have been propagandized and forced into this kind of false consciousness and, as and in a lot of ways, I think it is the um, the Republicans playing off of uh, Cold War era propaganda and McCarthyism that is taught to the John Birchers, yeah, which we exactly. didn't mention, and they're relevant even to this. But that strategy <laughs> really uh, was tested in 
worked out during the John Birch Society period. Yeah. So, you know, what we've got here um, now essentially is what we need is a popular movement. We need anarchism, like real anarchism back in the streets to uh, oppose um, this, uh, you know, uh, essentially cabal of um, monsters, uh, sycophants and cowards um, with the power of the people. Uh, I said this immediately after Roe v. Wade was overturned. You know, we knew it was going to come. Don't mourn. Organize. Use this time that we have. And it's it's not a lot of time. uh, And things are going to get crazier and crazier as capitalism breaks down, which it will, because it's been breaking down year after year. uh, And, you know, the uh, we we've got the issues like rising sea levels, global warming, all of this stuff, climate change, uh, like what is important here is that you speak and you vote and you realize that voting is the least of your of your um uh of your responsibilities to fixing this problem you get people in the streets you get people calling the politicians that works bury them in calls bury them in letters you get direct action uh you you get revolutionary art these are the things that will turn the clock back on on these fascist bastards um you know it's going to be a long road ahead but but the answer to the radical right the answer to january 6th is a uh powerful and committed radical left that instead of being dedicated to the vanity of a couple of men and the uh, and a few uh, the profits of some industries are dedicated to uh, to humanity, to the human soul, to the preservation of human life and liberty um, above all laws that man has made or ever will make. I mean, that's anarchism. That's that's what we have to do, and that's why we can't let it be lost to something like um, uh, anarcho capitalism. And I, I think, luckily. I think the anarcho capitalists have, for the most part, failed. The internet made it impossible for them to continue with this strategy. But, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that it's a long road ahead and everyone's going to have to do something. Like, just to add to that, I think I agree with you about a street uh, strategy, that a popular street movement definitely will happen and is needed, and anarchist participation will be important. It is, I've watched this happen so many times now in my life, though, where whether it's the anti-war movement, the count, uh, alter globalization movement, whether it was Black Lives Matter, Occupy, when political parties are put into leadership positions in popular movements, this is, it's not about voting. This isn't an argument about that, which I have my own arguments about, but yeah. they're way less important. It's about who takes leadership in a popular struggle. And when Mm -hmm. the political parties, they are called political machines for a reason. When they get into leadership positions in these movements, that's uh, you be that movement's just going to become the tail to Mm -hmm. that political party's machine. Yeah, absolutely. Every time. And that's honestly why Occupy was uh, destroyed. Um, People forget about this. Um, But. Uh, so some very wealthy and connected people with the Democratic Party came to Occupy and essentially offered for us to become their Tea Party. They wanted mm-hmm. us to be a voter drive for Obama. Um, and uh, this was set up by, um, I think it was, uh, I hate to speak against him because I actually really like him otherwise, but um, one of the people from, uh, I think it was Ben from Ben and Jerry's. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Wow. Well. He and and several other you know very wealthy Democrats wanted to set up a essentially a fund um, that would pay people uh, and provide f- provide for all the kinds of actions that we needed to do buy our signs or whatever get us uh, you know put up somewhere where we could stay and Occupy told them to take a hike. And it absolutely 100% refused their money. And it wasn't until after that happened, and, and fairly shortly after that happened, that Michael Bloomberg destroyed Occupy. Yeah, I, I could, I, I'm not, I would put it at so like top one or two 
important things like to really be talking about right now is preventing that from happening because i mean whether it's greenpeace <laughs> again the anti-war movement literally any of the important struggles of the past like 50 60 years uh have been left uh led into um not just reformism but the failure to reform anything mm -hmm. and i think you're Totally right. Keep talking, by the way. I've got something to add, but it'll All take right. me a second. And it's so it's so sneaky the way that they do it, because when they when these political representatives came into Occupy in Phoenix, where I live, the first thing they did was they set up a website that was an anti-anarchist website, and they immediately condemned the uh, what they considered to be violent tactics, and they emphasized nonviolent Gandhian strategies. Uh, and created a Facebook group called Occupy Democrats or Democrats for Occupy or something oh my like God. that. That's that. That's the origin of that page. Yes. Uh, and if you go into the history, if you go to the person who made that page, it is an explicitly anti-anarchist uh, web page that was created at the time to divert anarchist leadership of Phoenix Occupy into. Uh, a nonviolent and ultimately democratic party um, led movement. And it worked all too well. Uh, and of course, you know, no one was worried about the anarchists after that. <laughs> Once yeah. the Democrats got their, got their uh, momentum from the Occupy Phoenix uh, participants, they, they were happy to forget about the anarchists. Absolutely. Well, I remember um, uh, Sally Cohn, um, who was uh, the head of like a liberal, um, uh, like, uh, I, I guess the, the head of like a liberal um, think tank at the time, uh, sort of saw her uh, perform once at uh, a... So I had a friend who basically created a stage version of the daily show with him as John Stewart. <laughs> That's how endemic the daily show was. And, uh, Sally Cohn was one of his first guests. And I remember I went up to her afterwards cause you know, I wasn't uh, an anarchist quite yet. And I was just like me and my roommate were like, we are so pissed off. Um, we do not like the way this country is going. What can we do? And she was just like, uh, join move <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah and even then i was like mm, no that's not gonna work <laughs> actually sorry let me just correct something really quick and i'm gonna well i'll send you the link later but uh it was occupy phoenix and peace was the name of the page oh okay but yeah. occupy phoenix and peace uh well it's, i'm sure occupy democrats was under some other shady uh, thing. Right. I I have no idea who the people are behind that page, and I know most of the major figures in Occupy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so anyway, yeah. I mean, they're they're sneaky as hell. And yeah. if all the everything we just said about the anarcho capitalists and the Libertarian Party, uh, I mean, it'll come from the the liberals as well. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you even see it now. Um, L L Senator uh, Lindsey Graham, um, his response to Bernie uh, calling for, you know, Medicare for all is, but people will lose their private health insurance and they really like it. That's the exact same line of like Klobuchar and Buttigieg and, and freaking Biden. And the Republicans are just saying the same thing and be because they their interests are exactly the same. Um, or close to exactly the same. Um, of course, or as Bush said, Americans love to shop. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So this is something that I uh, actually wanted to to read. Uh, this is in. Uh, I'm about to release a ten page. Um, a supplemental comic. It's a prequel to Derudi's Shadow of the People called Los Errantes. Uh, it chronicles uh, Derudi's um, uh, adventures before um, the Spanish Civil War. Um, and this one is based on a real incident in Cuba 
um, where uh, he was down there like working to try to organize the Cubans uh, to throw off their capitalist masters. <laughs> um, but uh, Duri said, um, you know, when a worker rebels in isolation, he is imprisoned and beaten to a pulp or worse, uh, thrown into one of those prisons um, from which you only leave feet first. When professional, but when the prof a professional leads the union, he'll inevitably betray the rank and file. It is pointless to re rebel individually. The revolt has to be collective. If the union is you, uh, and you are all perpetually vigilant, and expel those who try to impose themselves, then you will prevent the emergence of new leaders. If you stay united and insist on your demands, Machado won't have enough police to beat you or enough cells in which to imprison you. And that is from uh, uh, Derudi in the Spanish Revolution by Abel Paz, uh, actual member of uh, the CNT Fi, uh, who was, uh, he's a historian. Uh, he was also jailed by Franco for, for quite a while. Um, a brilliant book uh, by AK Press. I highly recommend everybody get themselves a copy. I'll definitely include that in the show description. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we've, talked about all sorts of stuff and our focus was going to really only be on Rothbard. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's impossible just to talk about Rothbard once you go down this. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think so. The good thing is, is that, you know, you bread tube is essentially created around exposing weirdos <laughs> and their propaganda. So I, I, I hope that the video will be very um, uh, illuminating for people. I, I have a feeling it, it might do pretty well in the algorithm. And if nothing else, it'll annoy the end caps. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. Thank, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Is there any, any last, last things you want to say to the audience? Um, you know, uh, so I am going to be hitting the convention circuit. Um, now that uh, COVID is, is mostly passed and they've, they've signed off. My son can be vaccinated now. So, um, I, you can look for me. I'm going to be, uh, at Capcom in, in Michigan, uh, not Capcom, but Cap, Capcom in Michigan uh, with Scout Comics. Uh, I will be selling Derudi uh, along with um, uh, Supplemental Comics and Snow White Zombie Apocalypse. Uh, I will also be at Dragon Con uh, this um, uh, this Labor Day. Uh, I think September first to well, whatever the the labor day weekend whatever it is september 1st to 5th or whatever um and uh i will also be at cincinnati comic expo uh in late september i believe or maybe that's even november um so definitely come by if you want to shake my hand or um you, you know throw up a fist or <laughs> whatever or talk i'd be very happy to do that um you know and hopefully i will be traveling along more around more often. Um, the art for uh, Derudi Shadow of the People number two is, it, the line art is done. Um, uh, you appear in it <laughs> as a, you make a cameo. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, the uh, that will hopefully be colored soon, and I'll run a Kickstarter for that. Uh, I'm after I am just about to launch a Kickstarter for the Spanish language uh, Derudi Shadow of the People, uh, fully translated into Spanish. And if we get funded enough, maybe we'll get it translated into Catalan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, hang on. You're you're muted. I'm not hearing you. Oh, I I, I said that would be really cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it, it would be very, very cool. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm going to keep doing Derudi. Uh, I have another series about ready to launch. Um, it's a collaboration between myself and Kit Bus, the original, uh, designer, uh, of all the characters in critical role, it's like campaign one. So if you go to the, the critical role TV show, um, the legend of Vox Machina, I believe it's on Amazon, uh, streaming. She, is the one who designed every single one of those characters. 
Um, and she's also just really cool to work with. She's done some other covers for Derudi, and uh, I'm really excited about the work that we're doing. And you know, the uh, the radical left will <laughs> enjoy my sense of humor. It's a comedy series. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, I'm doing that. You can find me on my YouTube channel. Uh, just search my name, Brenton Lengel, um, and uh, you know, hopefully, you'll see me uh, doing another um, uh, debate against a weirdo. Uh, I would recommend everyone, if you haven't seen it, go watch my opening statement from my debate against uh, Stefan Molyneux uh, because I offer him an egg at the beginning. <laughs> and the last thing he says in this debate to me before he storms out is, I don't want your eggs. <laughs> oh, jeez, That's awesome. Oh, yeah. I got to release that as a clip because I, I think that'll go around quite a bit. But yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you guys very much. Um, and, and thank you. Um, Cy should I call you Cyber Dandy? Cyber Dandy or Jared. Either one works. Uh, thank you, Jared. This is really awesome. I'm glad, you know, um, we've stayed, we've been in contact. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I just said everybody like keep making the argument for a saner, more compassionate uh, world. It's more important now than ever uh, to do that. And please don't fall for anarcho-capitalist bullshit. And if you are an ANCAP and you're watching this, don't feel bad that you fell for an ANCAP bullshit. There literally millions of dollars have been spent to make you an ANCAP. Um, yeah, so that, that's me. Thank you guys very much. Uh, my website is brentlingle.com, uh, at brentlingle on Twitter. Go yell at me. <laughs> All right. <laughs>